Hello. We are glad that you all have chosen to be here. Rain or shine, God is good. Uh, we have a, uh, a wonderful Wednesday night plan. Lynn Blackman is going to be doing the teaching up here. And so uh, join us in a prayer. Good to see everyone tonight. Got a few coming in. Give it just a second. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so great and so awesome. We just thank you, Father, for all the blessings you've given us. Father, we are just so happy to be here and, and to call you Lord and come together and, and study a portion of your word and hear songs and, and get to pray and be with fellow Christians in the middle of the week. Father, we count it as a joy. So, Father, everything we do here tonight, we pray that that will be glorious to you and that, that it will be a sweet smell to you, Father, as we worship you tonight. Be with us and forgive us when we do wrong. It's our faith, is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Sunday, Doug asks the question about if someone walked in, who would be impressed by that, or who that would be that would impress someone. And Jack said, Roger Stubb. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and I was like, oh, good one. Good one. Love Roger Stubb. And it made me think about Roger's playing career, and one of the things that made him so special, do I need this? Okay. One of the things that made him so special was, is that they could be behind 10 points, three minutes left in the game, 
And Dallas got the ball and was like, we're in this, we can win. Yeah. yeah, Roger can do this. And it made me think, you know, it was, it was a faith thing with us. But it made me think, how did he get his team to believe in that? They had faith in him, right? I guarantee you, he looked at their, looked at their faces, looked them in the eyes, in that huddle and said, we're not out of this, guys. We're going to win. We're going to win today. And so it, it reminded me of our life. And I'm not doing anything. Put it closer so you can turn it down. Put the mic closer? Yeah. Okay. And so it, of course, brought me to the famous verse. What does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And it goes on and says, Thus also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. It goes on and says, Do you see that when it talked about Abraham, of course, getting ready to sacrifice Isaac like Doug talked about Sunday. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So what was it about Roger? They had faith in him. How? Because he was a leader of men. And he inspired his team, teammates, to say, we are going to win this game. So by the same token, we have things that we do as Christians. We have faith, yes, but we also do works. And it's so important for us to go out and achieve these victories by our works and helping and being good Christians. 1 Peter said, in 1 Peter 4, 19, says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So it's important for us to know that God is with us. He's going to support us in our daily journey, but also in our spiritual journey. And we just have to have faith that the works we do are going to ultimately give us victory. Let's continue on tonight. All right, Brad, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I'll make uh, no other comments about how we could have faith in the Cowboys then, but we don't have faith in the Cowboys now. Um, but we do have faith in Jesus, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, I do want to, uh, we come together not only to glorify Him, but also to come together as a group of people uh, to bear one another's burdens. Uh, and a burden that, that needs to be bared tonight is on behalf of Susie Irwin. She's at the hospital with her mother, uh, who is in critical condition. And so... Uh, I think most of you know Miss Susie, uh, so please keep her in your prayers and her mother, Donna, as well. So we're going to close out in prayer, and then if you are uh, not of uh, adult age, there's a kids class for you, and we'll send you off from there. So let's, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father God, tonight we want to lift up to you uh, Susie and her, her mother Donna and just pray that you'll be with her as uh, she's in critical condition. Lord, you, you know exactly what's going on. Uh, not, not only her, but there are so many other people right now throughout this country who are being hospitalized with various illnesses. Uh, and so God, I just I pray that you remind us that more than anything else that you're a God who hurts uh, when your children hurt. And so with all the... the the reasons why we, we could be frustrated or upset with, with how things are going on and hospitals are filling up and uh, the, the politics of that and, and so many things, just more than anything else, I pray that our emotion uh, is, is that of sadness uh, for people who are in these difficult situations. And let us be a people who, who run to 
uh, those who are hurting, those who need prayers, and, uh, and be a support uh, for them. Uh, Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity to be here together. It is just good to be around family tonight. Lord, I just pray that you be with Lynn and all the other teachers as they lead us. Just pray that, that their words will be removed from their mouths and your words will replace them. And it will all be about your glory and your son Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed for class. going to be leading the class tonight and I'll just say one thing I'm about to leave here and he's going to get to have the mic Speak it out, and, and two things one um, um, leave room for God's vengeance okay so you know if your enemy is hungry feed them he's thirsty give him something to drink in doing so you will keep burning coals on my head and if that doesn't motivate you enough to, to say nice things and turn the other cheek, I'll be back here on Sunday morning. So just remember. We're going to be looking at Matthew 13, 44. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, Doug actually asked me to take part. Uh, I'm more nervous than excited. He, uh, I got the text and I thought, man, he asked me to do <laughs> class. And then I looked at it and there's about 20 other names and mine was last, of course. <laughs> but I thought, well, you know, I just knew it had to be because he wanted me to do the hardest one, the toughest one, the most verses, the most explanation. He gave me one verse, Matthew 13, 44. So I had to go back to get the other parable next to it, and I got him because there's two in it. So we're going to look at three, three verses tonight. Uh, I wanted to do the best I could, whatever I do, it's just... If, if, if I don't approach anything like that, I'll lose interest and lose my place. So I looked up what really that you should have to do a good class, a good sermon, a good devo, that kind of stuff. And I found out that everybody who's ever done that, that puts something online, has a different idea. But I found one that kind of summed up... Uh, kind of had a compilation of, of his ideals of what it takes. So that's kind of what I'm following tonight. And uh, I'll go back with you right quick. First one was preparedness, and I'm all about that. My mother was left-handed. Uh, I don't know how many times Brett and his brothers heard the words, of failure to prepare, that's preparing to fail, you know. And to me, that's more than a cliche. So I got the preparedness covered. And then outline or structure. My whole lesson is outline. Right now, we're on 3B, okay? <laughs> if you want to write that down. So I knew I had that covered. And then it said, develop a line of communication with humor. And I thought, man, they've heard me try to talk before. So I felt like I had that covered. <laughs> and then it said, info to establish and support subject of discussion. I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm going to try and then the end with moral of story, parable in this instance, that's understandable and boldly presented. So after I looked at all that, I realized why Doug only gave me one verse. So that's how I'm approaching this tonight. I want to show, number one, the facts. What do we see on these parables from the outside looking in? And number two, what do we see as far as the feeling on the inside of these people in the parables. And then the third thing I'd like us to do is to actually try tonight to put ourselves 
in, in that person's place and, and see if it will help us, number one, draw closer to God, but also draw closer to each other in trying to uh, realize what a valuable pearl we have in Jesus and our relationship to Him, God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and our relationship with each other. Uh, okay, I'm on 5A. Uh, I read the parables, and I'm going to be real honest. I'm just, it said be transparent. So I thought, my first thought was, wow, I guess that's really important to these two guys. I mean, what a dumb comment. Of course it was important. I mean, it's just, if you look at what they did after they found the, the treasure and the pearl, side note, I've, I've got a new theory. Frida and Brett and Robin know about it. I'm convinced the older I get, there is dumb and then there's old man dumb. Okay. I, I'm getting good at that. Uh, I know now why a lot of times I start talking and Toby, our dog, is the only one that sits there and listens. So. But anyway, uh, I, it made me think about really what a comment I made and how Really, it, it wasn't real deep. So I thought, man, I've got to get deeper than that. Oh, it's important to them to find the pearl or to find the hidden treasure. So I'm going to try to do that. But before I do, I, I thought about some, we get dumb, bombarded with dumb questions and comments. If you get out in the world, really, when you involve the Bible or church, man, you can hear some some of them you just want to grab and shake and say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? But don't grab them and shake them, but anyway. So I thought, what's some of the dumb things I've been asked lately? Well, I went to the doctor here a while back, okay? And I feel that nowadays you've got to fill about 20 pages. And the second 10 is the same questions that was on the first 10. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, and then you go in the, in the office, and the one who does your blood pressure, you know, ask the same question. I'm like, why don't you read the paper? But anyway, I, so I got to look in some of the questions, and I promise I'll, I'll tie this all in here. Don't give up on me. It said name, Alfred Lim Blackman. Okay, that's my name. Then male or female. Who would name their girl Alfred? Of course I'm a man. I mean, my parents didn't hate me at birth, and I thought, well, that's okay. Next question, race. I thought, I limped in here. On my leg, it swelled up like a cantaloupe, and you asked me if I wanted to race. <laughs> uh, well, write that now. And then it says, where's the pain located? Right here, the one that's all swollen up. So I was beginning to doubt whether I really wanted to see this doctor, but then it says, was there an accident? And I thought, man, if I'm alive and attempting to do anything physical, there's always an accident. That's just, <laughs> that's just my life. And then it says, is the problem age-related? <laughs> I'm like, I think, if you check my birth certificate, my right knee was born the same time as my left knee. And what I'm saying is, I don't understand why do they have to ask that, okay? And then, has the pain gotten worse? No, I'm here because it feels better. I just want to share that. <laughs> you know? And then the big one, this implored me. In case of emergency, who do you want us to call? I'm in a doctor's office. Wouldn't that be a good choice? I mean, <laughs> an ambulance, an EMT. And I thought, no, you know, call my plumber. He did a good job on my sewer line. I'll let him replace it. my knee, you know. But what I'm saying all this is it goes on every day. And I noticed in my mind as I thought of that, I thought, how many times right over here at a shop where he used to do a bunch of work, People come in off the street, and I was the go-to. All my welders would send them to me, and that's okay. Uh, and some of the things they would say, and I'd question them, what do you, what's your relationship with God? I don't know. I mean, who does, you know? And do you, would you like to learn about Jesus? Well, maybe someday. But they were asking for help, but very few wanted the spiritual help, okay? They didn't understand there's a treasure that's greater than a meal or a battery on their car or whatever it is. But very few of them would listen about that. I thought how sad it is, you know. 
to realize that happens. So anyway, you can sometimes, out of humorous things, you can realize that through that humor, we can find treasures of our own. Things that we go back to and say, wow, I remember when the Lord did this for me, you know. And so there's so many times in our life, mine and Frida, is, and, and raising our sons, that we know God was there. That's how we got through. And, and it's things now we laugh about, but at the time it wasn't funny. And, but there was a treasure there. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So if you don't any, understand anything else I say tonight, I, I want you to know uh, that's not a cliche. I mean that. There's days we got through by the grace of God. And I'm going to be honest, we're in Hobbs, New Mexico by the grace of God. I never planned on living in Hobbs, New Mexico. And now I love it. Okay? You know, pardon me, I have trouble. Uh, my mouth gets dry, so just bear with me. Uh, that's kind of how I approach this, is I want to see what we can get out of this as a group. The way I want to do it, by the way, we're on 7A, okay? Uh, I want to go through and read some facts that I see. If you'll be kind, let me do that. Then I want to get y'all involved, okay? I, I want to hear what y'all see and what you think that person was feeling. And then we're going to all, at the end, we're going to all put ourselves there. So please, when we get that point, speak up. And you don't have to tell a life story, just what do you think? You know, how does it make you feel? What, where's your mind at when you read that? What would you do if you were there? And I think we can really get a lot out of it. Uh, okay, 7a, I'm reading 40, uh, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys a field. Okay, I'm going to go through what I see. We'll move through it like that and come back and y'all be ready. Again, that's either a warning or drawing attention. So let's look at the last sentence of the verse in 43. He, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. One man I looked up in the Greek said, that's not hear audibly. That's hear and comprehend, hear and understand. So he's saying, okay, I'm fixing to tell you again. I don't know about y'all, if my dad ever said, son, I'm fixing to tell you again. I said, uh, pay attention. That wasn't going to be a third time. So I think this is kind of a warning. And he, he wants to stress something here. The next thing, he says, kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Now what I noticed may not be significant. He doesn't say like a treasure. He said like treasure. So I see, in my mind, I see this guy walking across the field. He doesn't find a treasure chest or a bag of coins. Maybe he found the opening to a mine. It says he found treasure. I think it's more than just one thing. That's just me. Okay? That's kind of like the joy of finding Jesus Christ. You can't even believe all the blessings. There's not just one little thing you get in Jesus. Okay, that's what I see in this. Okay, the next phrase, uh, next part of this is, uh, he says, uh, uh, man found or discovered, he was not searching. Don't you remember that? We'll get to that again here in a little while. Found. Nowhere does it say he's searching, looking, investigating, asking for a mouth, none of that. Okay? And he hid. Now, I spent a lot of time on this, and I, I want to be sure I didn't misrepresent it. Uh, best I could find from about eight different Greek sources, it wasn't hid like, oh, I'm stingy. I don't, you know, I don't need to have any part of this. But it, he hid as to remove it from danger, okay? Probably the danger of somebody else finding it. I, I don't know that. But the main point stressed in several of them was, like a great treasure to protect. And three of them said the same thing. It's like they believed back then in their day of wearing clothes to protect their skin from the sun and the wind and the sand. So it was a real personal treasure that he found. So that's why I think it's more than just a bag of money, okay? Next, for joy, uh, he was happy about finding it. 
So I'm like, all right, all I gotta do is something out this treasure. I mean, it was special to him. And uh, one, that joy to me establishes a value and also a passion. I can see great value in something and not have a passion for it. And you people know what I'm talking about. That wasn't the case here, I don't believe. He, he was excited about finding this. It meant something to him more than just the value of what he was finding. Okay, and next he goes and sells all. He was willing to pay the price. Uh, kind of hard to think of someone who just accidentally discovered the treasure. That's what he did. He, he went in and, and can't you hear that conversation? Uh, Fred, I'm going to fix the sell everything we have and buy this piece of land. Uh, yeah. Why? Well, I think I found the treasure. You know, so he, he discovered something that wasn't apparent. Apparently wasn't, hadn't been found by somebody else that didn't know anything about it. Then he buys the field, he pays the price to possess it. Uh, it I think it was something that had to be really mined out. Uh, one note on this I found, in that time, in that damn time, if I'm going along and I find a treasure, if I leave it or replace it as buried, it is part of the field. If I remove it without buying it, it will spell. If I buy it while it's buried, it's part of the land, like a mineral right. Okay? And is also considered at that time, if it was sold, then the, the one who sold it couldn't come back and say, oh wait, that's mine, it was already there. So the guy was trying to do it right. That's what I see in this, maybe y'all don't. I think he was trying to do it legally right. Uh, next is just a, a note that, that I thought about, because I read two or three people said, well, you know, I see this man who was going across the field it's Jesus. And the, you know, he paid all to redeem the Israelites. And I understand that, but I have trouble with that. Now, you may, you may agree with that, okay? I have trouble with that. Let me tell you why. It would mean that Jesus would be doing something to gain something greater than what he is sacrificing. I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see Jesus sacrificing even to the point of his life so he could get more than what he gave. I, I don't see that as being, and I don't see any word in scripture, and I spent some time looking at this, I want you to know, for God ever said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the human race through Israel because they're more valuable than Jesus. I, I don't see that, so that, that opinion is out there, I don't agree with it, you may, and, and that's okay. Now, I don't want to get into the debate tonight about that. Uh, the moral, we'll get to it here in a little bit. I want y'all to pop in on that. Basically, to me, he's saying that all we sacrifice, the kingdom of heaven is going to be worth more than any of it. Okay? That's pretty simple. Okay, now we're, now we are, you, uh, on the next verses, 45, 46. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, okay. There's a word again, again. <laughs> it's a warning. Now listen here. Pay attention to this. Now, there's a man looking for a treasure. So I saw that right off. That's the obvious. That's the facts. Uh, he knew there was something of great value, or at least believed there was. He was searching for it. Real quickly, without warning you with Greek, the verb there means everything from hunted, looked for, uh, tried to possess, inquired, investigated, uh, uh, looked for maps, okay, and all that. And I'm not going to get into all that. Just that's the words I found out in the original Greek that that could be applied to that Greek verb. But anyway, he identified it, he recognized it, and he knew it was of great value, this single pearl. And so he went and sold all, 
And, and one other thing I noticed here, if, if you look, it says, <clears throat> who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all. Probably reading too much into this, but to me, it didn't say he continued on his journey. He changed the direction. And so to me, I was thinking, okay, he stopped what he was doing, found what he thought he wanted, and it changed his direction to go purchase that, to go what, do what he had to do to get that great pearl, or that pearl of great price. <clears throat> Not a big deal, but it's just something that, that I thought about. So I picture a man out there, and he finds this, and he said, well, I could go on, but I'm, I'm going to go back before I lose this and be sure I buy this land so I can have this pearl of great value. And the reason I, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but the reason that jumped out at me, I've, I've read these verses many times. I never noticed that. I never thought of it. But one thing we do know for sure, that we all agree on, Jesus Christ changes you. He'll change your direction. He changes your values. He changes the pearls you're looking for. He even changes how you view a pearl. Some of y'all have college students, and this I'm not giving this advice. I'm just sharing this with you. Uh, I'm not real smart, but I'm smart enough to know not to give advice anymore. Uh, that one event, to me anyway, I shouldn't say it does, but I believe it does, changes how you view that child. You say, oh, no, it's always my child. Should it always be your child? But somehow, some way, I didn't think that I could ever love our three sons more than when they was at home. But I found out that it changed my direction. And sometimes I was way slow. <laughs> They'll tell you. I still tried to be their daddy when, when I wasn't trying, when they probably didn't want it. But the value changed. It got greater and greater the more I saw them grow. And, and so that kind of all jumped out at me. That's something I saw. So uh, let me get a drink of water here. Okay, so now here we go. That's some quick observations I've made. Bad when you can't see with glasses. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I want you to really get into it. Uh, I want you tell me anything that you see. I'll, I'll start kind of the progress of this and y'all raise your hand. Uh, there's not a chair up here. Brad can kind of turn around and help watch any hands that go up because I may have trouble looking off sometimes and get back to what I was doing. So uh, I want everybody to have an opportunity. But there's two parables. Uh, I've kind of threw out what I see on, on the surface, the facts, and a little bit of what maybe these people were feeling. I don't know that they were. And so I want to hear now things you see in it. And don't be afraid to say, well, I see a man walking across the field. That's fine. That's what I, I want to know as you look at these with me tonight. And uh, the we'll end up with us trying to put ourselves right there. If you can do it. If I can do it, you can. And it really changed my view of some of this. It's a, kind of like the, uh, I'm being about as transparent as I can. About like the first time you think you're really in trouble with the law. <laughs> Change view of the courtroom, I promise you. And, uh, and what goes on and why it goes on. And so if you will really try to put yourself, man or woman, as that person crossing that field, accidentally finds it, or purposely looking for it, then I want to hear some of the things it means to you. Uh, question is number one. Uh, it's not right or wrong stuff on this. This is how you feel. What do you feel about accidentally or searching for something? You don't have to go 15 verse answer. Just what, to you, what's, like, 
What's the difference in you coming across something or really going out looking for it? What's that, what's that mean to you? Anybody? Okay. So, I mean, in these two verses, both of them are talking about the kingdom of heaven and people finding something or searching for something. I think as 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 people, whether we know we're looking for God or not, we are. So we may come across him by coming across someone who tells us about him, or we may go searching and we may go to churches looking for God, but either way, yeah. we're going to come across. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead, Tiff. You're saying, did he accidentally hide it again? Well, no, I mean, like, you know, it, kind of when you always through the years read it, it's like, oh, he found it, and now he goes and buys his land because he wants to keep it on it. But the way it sounds, I mean, the way it reads is when the man finds it and hid it. So it, it looks like he found it accidentally, but then he hid it on purpose, okay. and he wanted to buy the land where he could keep it. I believe he did. And, and, and I think he tried to do it legally. I really, that... Several of the commentaries they that they led me to think that. Anybody but else? If he just found it, huh? but if he just found it, why would he have to do it legally? Well, because <laughs> he couldn't. If he took it out by law, it was stealing without owning the land. If he notified the owner while he had the land by the by their law back then, it was the owner's. That's why I say I think he is trying to do it right. Anybody else? The, the aspect, especially in the second story, about selling everything he had for that special pearl. You know, there was a commercial years ago, and, and it was a guy, and he's at an art auction. And, you know, he buys the piece of art, and he says, okay, now I want to sell it. Well, uh, the point was that you have to invest, and it, it's a long-term investment. And that's kind of what I see in this other one. That was such a precious pearl. He sells everything he has to possess it, knowing that the only profit's going to come from that through a lifetime. You know, I mean, it's going to be a long-term investment. And I kind of see that as a kingdom thing, too. That, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, when we're first baptized, we're all giddy and that great feeling. But it's a long-term investment to, to salvation. And it takes that commitment of, you know, giving all you've got to get the... Uh, to pay off. Well, you, you started my next question. Okay, just say I'll get back to you, Brad. Guy? Uh, I was reading this second one about Pearl. So to get a kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. So the merchant was kind of, to me this almost parallels the lost shepherd. The, where the lost shepherd is searching for his one sheep and he goes and hunts that one sheep. So heaven is like a merchant. Sells everything. And then it's about everybody else who focuses on that one good soul. There's me. Go ahead. And it, it kind of follows suit later on when you read the next parable. From over the net, separating the, the good from the wicked. So I see that paralleling the good shepherd. I agree. Let me tie that into what you were talking about. My next question was what 
What cost is joy? We know recognition of value, but what, anybody, what, what, everything, why not relate? Well, I think, I think it, whenever he found it, you know, whether he was looking for it or it was, you know, he just stumbled upon it. I think he, he committed to it. He committed to it. He put everything he had into it. You know, and that's what God's asking us to do, telling us to do with, with the, with the, with the word. He wants us to commit to it. Put everything we have into that that investment and live our lives with it. Anybody else? He's right on target what I think. Anybody else? What do you think causes it, Doug? I, I just think, and this just blows my mind, I think he had joy because like, he realized that he could take possession, he could have that yeah. valuable that could be his. It's such an unbelievable treasure. And the joy was knowing that he could he could obtain it. He could take everything that he had and, and actually get that, have that joy and that treasure. Where otherwise he couldn't have imagined ever getting it. I agree. I, I, I think there's a recognition of the value, yes. That's part of joy. But man, the possession of whatever it is that's valuable. To me, that's why he was so joyous. The who? Somebody over here. I, I was looking at this as it's, it's not really a pearl. First question is how would a pearl be out in the desert? What I'm looking at is maybe he saw the land that had the highest quality of whatever he wished to do with it uh, for farming or raising flocks of sheep or whatever. But it, it's, I would think it would be always better to stumble across something and find it and, and be so excited about it instead of saying, okay, there, there's a certain thing around somewhere. I'm just going to look at it until I find it. I, I never thought that. I just assumed he was walking in the edge of the ocean where you, uh, where you find these. That's all. I'm I'm a dry lander. I don't know much about the ocean, but uh, I, but they weren't far from it. Huh? They weren't far from it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's true. And right here, where, but you know, one thing I noticed is is Doug touched on it. Lee did. Is that that commitment to possess something. That, to me, goes along with the searching. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, I'd always question Frida when she was teaching, about the little kids, and what drove them, what, you know, and, and the teachers, and one time I said, well, who's, who's the best teacher in your whole building? Well, it's Miss So-and-so. Why? She said, she just, said she, she just thrives on getting those kids' attention and, and teaching them that they can learn first and then teaching them things. And, and she said, it's just, she's so committed to it. And I never forgot that. And that, that's what, you know, that teacher was searching for that every single child that she could help, you know. And that's kind of how I see this guy. I think he knew, I think he knew inside of, uh, of a shell there could be a, a pearl. And I think he was out there searching for it. But anyway, I, I believe there's, I believe Doug's right there is the possession that, that's got to be important to you. Uh, Ronnie. Uh, about 27 years ago, I lived this because I was about as sorry a rascal as you ever saw. And I had a, a real powerful gun. My next <clears throat> stop was uh, AFL CIO headquarters in Washington, D.C. And then Jesus showed up, and he called, and he didn't mess around. But I hid it, because I didn't want to lose all the good stuff I had. And, uh, but then I began to search. I went and drug my grandmother's Bible out of a box in the storehouse and began to read. And uh, after a while, I realized that, hey, this is really, this is the good stuff. 
So I gave up everything <clears throat> and and uh, became a Christian. And I quit that job and uh, suffered a lot of retaliation, lots, lots of stuff. But I I did it and I found that uh, that great treasure, which was Jesus and uh, being in Christ. And then for the rest of my life, I've been searching. So that I can be a useful tool to the master. And uh, it's, it's, uh, this is people's lives here. You know, we're just wandering along. We do what we used to, and we stumble into this treasure somehow or other. And, uh, and then we decide, boy, this, this is what I've been looking for. I, I think one thing I've noticed too is people who really have a passion and and have found that pearl and selling out for it, a lot of other people make fun of them. I'm talking about in the Christian world. I'm not talking about the non-believers making fun of them. And it's kind of sad, you know, uh, but that's kind of off track. But anyway, re next question right quick. The recognition of the cost, uh, you, it showed that you had to be willing to sell all. Now, to you, if you're seeing this person, okay, that's one thing. Now I'm asking you, you are that person. Now what does the ideal or the principle or the words sell all to have your pearl? Now what's it look like? Y'all speak up. I know we have some thoughts on this. It's not the same for everybody. There's not a bunch of right or wrong answers, okay? That's some big joy to get me to sell it. Do what? That's big joy to get me to sell everything. He said, because of his joy, he went and sells everything he had to buy it. And that's that's a lot of oh, joy. That's that's easy to say. say. Yeah, I can't. Easy to say, but you think about that. She makes a good point. What's selling out mean to y'all? You don't have to name names or anything. I mean, just... You don't have to tell stuff you give up, but what, when you think, wow, okay, I'm that guy, and yeah, I found this, and I know it's valuable, and I really want to possess it, uh, I'm so joyful, but now, what's it going to cost me? All right, let me say another one. How do you count the cost? Anybody? What do you, what do you think it means? Doug, you've been in the spotlight. Uh, you put yourself up here every week. You can't convince me at some time, in some time in your life, and probably every week, you don't have to count the cost. What's that mean? What's that look like? I'm not talking about a life story, just what, what's that look like to Doug? I'm picking on you, but. Well, I'm, I'm just still wrapping my head around the fact that like, he sold everything, especially in the second story, and he's, he has. Now, if you have to turn it off, I can talk loud if I have to. Oh. Just that cut all the safety nets. There were no safety nets. It wasn't, this is good, but if it doesn't work out, I can fall back on this. It was all or nothing. That's right. That's right. 
You couldn't hold back a little and keep it in your savings back then. He's, it says he sold all. What? You know, what's that? Now, I'm going to pick on Mike Mills. Cause I, I'd rather pick on him than his sweet wife. But, uh, he helped us do a well in demonstration. What time am I supposed to stop? I'm not going to get through all this, but anyway. It's, uh, right quick, and he was there. I said, man, I'd like Coach Mills to be there. Because I, Brett was there helping, and one of our welders were. And we're all good with kids, but I said, just in case somebody gets out of line, I, I didn't want to grab them like I would one of my kids when they were that age and end up in jail. He said, hey, no problem. But we could go through all this stuff, and then he's t they're all around there. He probably don't remember it. He says, okay, guys and girls, now they told you, showed you some of the things you'll learn if you want to make a living as a welder. He said, now the question is, do you want to put in all the hard work they've had to, to, to do that, to be a welder? And what's that look like to you with your, with your students and your athletes, Coach? Why, why do you have to, I know you have to make a decision to sell out to, to get to tell some of them about the Lord. It's, it is. And, and I, I gripped Doug for one pearl or one treasure. That's uh, it's hard for me to think about. It. You know, I'll sacrifice a lot of things for somebody or something or something I want to work, but to give up everything else? Uh, man. Man, to, to piggyback off of what Coach said, I, several years ago when I was still in Sweetwater, they had had a pretty good year in football and so they were excited about this next year because most of their kids were coming back and they all put these big sayings on the back of their truck uh, one had all state and one of them had um, all in uh, and then one guy had almost <laughs> <laughs> and I just I, I think I think what Coach Bills was saying is, is that like it's not just a one time I want to do this, I'm going to yeah. hit the way where it's like every single day. Like that guy woke up in the morning with no food, but he had that pearl and like he had to make a conscious decision. And I think following Jesus is that an every day decision to follow him, that, that there are consequences that these guys face every day when they decided to, to sell everything to follow him. And, mm -hmm. and so it might not, I, we get a glamorize, oh, that one big moment, but I think it's just that continually following Jesus. Yeah. I, on tough days. My mind is, I'm out there anyway, y'all know that, but I, I always wondered, I wonder how long he had to hunt <laughs> that pearl, you know? And I wonder how far across that land that guy was, before he stumbled on that treasure, things like that. So I'd love to hear more from y'all. I think we're out of time. Uh, I, I got some more questions here, but that's okay. I, I appreciate all y'all's comments, and I just sat here and love to hear all of you because y'all are starting to open up now. And uh, one thing I want you to know, I do not believe that Jesus is saying, okay, you have to go sell everything you own in Hobbs, New Mexico, or wherever you own it, in order to follow me. But I do believe he's saying that 
a life with him that leads to salvation is worth more than anything you'll ever have in this life. And I'll stand by that. I, I believe I can prove that by scripture. I'm not trying to dictate your life. Okay, you get, that's not the object. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, I've, I've been that man that, thank God, I had a wife, three sons, that I'd look to for answers. And I was raised going to church, okay? And I knew the right way and the wrong way, and I knew how to, I guarantee you, if you with my dad, you worked. You had a purpose, and you knew what it was, and you gave it all you had. And then you get out in life, sometimes it's easier to, like Doug says, and, and Coach says, you, you just, Brett always used to tell our welders, if you lit up just a little bit, it's going to be easier to do less next time and less next time, you know. And I've had to face that time before. I've had to face it when, I'm afraid to say, now, Lynn, you better listen to me. <laughs> You're not thinking too smart, you know, and I thank God she did. And some of y'all have influenced me. Make no mistake about it. And I'm not saying that because I'm running for office or trying to get a job. Our elders are smarter than that, okay? I'm just telling you the truth. But sometimes what I'm saying is we see that, but do we want to be in that weight room every morning? Do we want to be at the dance practice every night? I got a granddaughter. I don't know how she does it. I admire her. I wouldn't go to dance that many times. I'm sorry, I don't care how good she is, and she is. And I hate to use her as an example. I bless you not here in person. But I see that pearl that she's looking for. Uh, I, we're out of time. Uh, Mr. Pryor in the back, he found the pearl, didn't he? You know, and, and he had stumbled around for years, said he wasn't really looking for it. And, and I've been there, and I've made those wrong decisions, and, and the, the old Lynn has tried to come out. And what I'm telling you is nothing that I could have ever gained is greater than what all the Lord has done for me. And I know a bunch of y'all could say the same thing. So sorry we're out of time. Uh, Doug, I didn't pick on you. Remember that Sunday? Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your kind attention. Uh, did you have anything? No, sir. I want to ask everybody, if you would, remember the name Rachel Sorheim. She has battled cancer for two or three years. Uh, been a trooper. I mean, it's a good friend of ours, wife. And she leaves Sunday. They leave Sunday. She's going for 11 days for a bunch of reconstructive surgery. And he wanted our prayers. Rachel Sorheim. So uh, I appreciate you. Remember that name and, and take time to see her as a pearl that loves the Lord and, and pray for her well being. Anything else? If you'll bow with me, we'll end in word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, we, we know that there's no doubt you are the only true and living God. Jesus is the Son of God our King, our Redeemer, our best friend. The Holy Ghost is our comforter, our helper. And dear God, let us be bold to tell the world what a great treasure it is to know this and how willing we'll be every day to pursue it and to commit our lives to it. Help us to be those who are willing to proclaim the name of Jesus and defend the name of Jesus as individuals and as a church. Dear God, we pray for the, for the sick. We pray for Rachel. And, and we pray for, for everyone on our list. And, and pray that you would deal with them as only you can. But dear God, above all things tonight, we know that you were here. You promised to inhabit the praise of your children. And I just pray that you were happy with everything that we did and that you look down on us through the perfectness of Jesus Christ and see us as beautiful children. And thank you for loving us the way you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.